Pray with me. Gracious and holy God, at this table of your word, may we find wisdom and encouragement through your spirit to give our lives away as gifts to the world for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. It may be the moment of my life I am most ashamed of. It was 20 years ago. We had moved to Bellingham in upstate Washington, and I was waiting to start my studies at Regent College in Vancouver. In the meantime, I had gotten a part-time job working at the local public library. Bellingham, like Shoney, has an indigent and homeless population. Uh, people that Rich, Rich Mullins refer, referred to when he, when he called them the two-legged memorials to the laws of happenstance. People who are suffering, people who are hurting, people who are broken by life in many ways. And the library, being a public facility, is one of the few places that people like that could find some measure of peace and respite without being constantly harassed. Uh, and so there were these spots within the library, uh, peaceful, quiet places that weren't frequented a lot. One of them was the young adult room, in fact, for some reason. I don't know why. And so frequently we would have folks who would um, go back to that room and they would sit and read or sometimes just sit or whatever it is that they were doing. And this one particular day I was back there and I was putting and shelving things and the room was empty except for one man sitting at a table in the middle of the room. Uh, he was filthy. Uh, and he was unkempt. And he was fast asleep with his head down on the table. And as I walked past him at one point uh, to get from one part of the room to the other, I was suddenly hit by the smell. And in my heart, I looked at this man, and all I could feel at that moment was contempt. To be very honest with you. I couldn't see him in that moment as a human being. He was a problem that I needed to solve. And I didn't like having to solve it. And why was he landing on my doorstep today? On it went. And I wrestled for the next several minutes with the voice that I know now is the Holy Spirit challenging me, trying to get me to see beyond myself my own selfishness in that moment. And I'll talk more about that story in a second. There's a line here in the, in the reading from 1 Timothy. The Apostle Paul says, saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, whom I am foremost. Now, there's a lot of arguments about whether or not Paul really wrote 1 Timothy and, and stuff like that. I happen to think he did because this is pure Paul right here. If there is a list of all the things, you know, the, those lines that you know, Paul said that people were familiar with, this one's got to be in the top ten. Everybody knows this one. Everybody knows, you know, from the King James Version, the chief of sinners. Right? Um, it is, it's, it's quintessential Paul. It's filled with pathos and it's filled with passion, uh, the desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ with tremendous humility and just a smidge of arrogance. <laughs> because Paul always has to be the best at anything he's doing, especially if that means being the sinner. He's going to be the best sinner. <laughs> or most one. <clears throat> But listen to how he follows this up. He says, But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example for those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Paul was never satisfied simply being a believer in Jesus. 
wasn't even really satisfied just with being a follower of Jesus. He wanted to be a servant of Jesus. He wanted to reflect the, the heart of God in his own life. He wanted to be an icon of God's love. He wanted his life to be a theater of grace. He wanted to be able to show everyone around him what it was that God would do in and through their lives if they would just follow Jesus like he was. Paul was captured by the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Over and over again in in his writings, he uses the phrase, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Because for Paul, it wasn't simply a matter of Jesus coming into his heart. He wanted to come into the heart of Jesus. He wanted to be in Christ so that when God looked at Paul, he would see Jesus. And he preached that gospel to us that, that we were invited into that same relationship so that when God would look at us, he would see his son Jesus and that the relationship between God and us would be like the one between God and Jesus. And Paul uses a word, which you've probably heard before, Abba, in his writings. Abba is in Aramaic, the language of Jesus. It's the, it's the name that you have for dad, especially when you're a little kid. It's daddy, if you will. But it's daddy in the little southern sense, where you get 60-year-old men who still call their dad, give their father's daddy, right? It's that intimacy that lasts for a whole lifetime, the relationship between a child and a parent. And that word appears three times in the New Testament. Twice it appears in the writings of Paul, one in Romans and one in Galatians, where in both cases Paul is talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So in one case he says that we've been given a spirit of adoption. In another he says the Spirit's been shed abroad in our hearts. In both cases, so that we will be able to call God, Abba, to say to God, Abba. And then he translates it because everybody he's writing to speaks Greek. So he says, uh, that means Patros, that means Father. Now, it's kind of funny. You just wonder, why on earth didn't he just say father and be in with? Why mess around with some dead language, right? Nobody speaks Aramaic where he's writing. But the reason is because it goes back to the earliest memories of the church. It goes back to the earliest Jerusalem community where they were speaking Aramaic. And it's something that they didn't want anybody to forget, probably because it goes back to Jesus himself. So the third time that Abba appears in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Mark, which is probably the oldest and the earliest of our Gospels. And it's in the moment when Jesus is in the garden, and he's on his knees and he's praying, and he says, Lord, and he says to Father, Abba, take, let this come past me. Don't, don't, let me. don't let me go through this. I don't want to endure this. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And so we get a picture now of what it means to call God Abba. What does it mean to have that relationship with God between parent and child, like Jesus had? It means to be an agent of God's will in the earth. A child has the heart of its parent, looks like its parent, walks like its parent, talks like its parent. And that's partly what Paul is talking about here in 1 Timothy. What does it mean to be a child of God it means to look like God, to be motivated by the things that motivate God, to be driven by the things that drive God, to have the heart of God in one's own life. What is that? That's what takes us to the gospel reading today from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 15 is a, has a three-part story, and we get two of the parts in our reading today, and then the third one we don't get, but you already know it. You'll know when, when I say it. So we get these stories. The first one is, well, we've got the, the shepherd. He's got the sheep. He loses one of his sheep. He risks life and limb. He goes out and finds the sheep. He comes back, throws a party, and there's much rejoicing in the land. The next story, the lady, she's got 10 silver coins. It's a lot of money. She loses one of them. She searches high and low for it. She finally finds it. She invites her, all her neighbors over to have a party. There's much rejoicing in the land. All right? The third story, the one that we don't hear today, is the story of the prodigal son. And you all know it. So we have a story about a lost sheep, and we have a story about a lost coin, and then we have a story about a lost son. And the thing is, is that the lost thing isn't really the point. 
Oh, they're seeking. Don't, don't get me wrong. And when the lost thing is found, well, with the sheep, there's much rejoicing. And with the coin, there's much rejoicing. And when the lost son is found, then there's much re- Except for the older brother who's outside moping. No rejoicing there. And that's the point of the story. Because Jesus tells us about the father trying to reach his older son and saying, son, your brother was lost and now is found. You've been here with me this whole time. You know my heart. You know what moves me. Because you've been with me. Can't you rejoice with me over this, your son, your brother? And that's where Jesus leaves that story. He leaves it with a cliffhanger. Because we don't know what the older brother is going to do. For a long time, I, uh, I kind of had an older brother mentality. I thought, Lord, I've never been the prodigal son. I've, I've never run off, done crazy things, whatever. I've been kind of a boy scout. <clears throat> My mother, if she were here, would attest to this. Uh, I, you know, I just didn't get in trouble. Because early on, I got caught a lot. And I just figured, well, there's no point in that. <laughs> Uh, like I say, you know, it's like that movie Legends of the Fall. I'm the brother who's not Brad Pitt. It's apparently, I mean, Brad Pitt, you can do anything you want. People still love you. The poor older brother in that one, we don't even remember the guy's name. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, man, what benefit is there in being the older brother? Until that day in the library. until my heart was challenged to remember that I had been with the Father all along and I had been learning to feel what the Father feels. I had been learning to love the way the Father loves. I had been learning to have the heart the Father has to reach out to this world, to not abandon it to its darkness, but to insist on carrying light into every corner that I can. And it isn't just with the homeless and the hungry. What about the foster parent who takes a child in, who's got a foul mouth and foul disposition? Teachers who take a, a, a class that's difficult or keep reaching out to a student that they're not getting through to. People who move into abandoned neighborhoods or broken business districts establish a home or a business and plant their flag and say, I'm going to be part of something amazing here. I'm going to bring life where there's lifelessness. I'm not going to leave this place to ruin. Artists, academics who raid the unspeakable in order to speak to a world that's still talking to itself in strange metaphors. Still caught up in its own death, self-reference. To bring the love of God to those places. We have a God who seeks. That's what Jesus is telling us. We have a God who does not, is not satisfied sitting in heaven with just those who decided to show up or those who didn't happen to get lost along the way, but keeps looking for those who are not here yet. And the glory of having been found is that you now have the opportunity as a child of God to have the heart of your Father and to seek and to rejoice when that which is lost is found. We come to this table of thanksgiving today. Receive the life of God. Part of what we're being reminded is that it's kind of costly to do that. There's a cross in this world for everyone who wants to live in light instead of darkness. You know, you'll lose money, you'll lose friends, you'll lose reputation, you'll lose ambitions. Sometimes you just plain lose. But that's all right. Because you have the heart of your Father. And the joy of the Lord is in the seeking and the finding of the things that are lost. I really wish that I could tell you.